How you doing? My name is Chris Matthews. I'm your relationship coach and licensed marriage and family therapist. And in this video, I'm going to talk about boundaries. I'm going to go through the four different type of common boundary intruders. And then the video will conclude with me listing five different steps or approaches you can take to protect your intimate relationship and establish good, healthy boundaries. The first thing we got to look at is what are boundaries? I like to think of boundaries as the lines that regulate decision-making lines that regulate safety and security. Also the playing field. So when you think about sports, let's take football, for example, or basketball, or even soccer, there's usually a field of play. The boundaries are the markers that determine certain outcomes. When a player throws the ball out of bounds, then the next team or the other, excuse me, the other team gets possession. If in baseball, it's a foul ball, it went outside of the boundary. So boundaries are designed in sports to regulate the game of play. Boundaries and relationships are common or similar because they regulate standards. So different types of boundaries, notifications, having access to your partner and letting them know, letting them know the plan. My wife and I have a routine that plays into our boundary of when we get off work or we leave a designated place on the way home, we give a call or text, hey, on the way home, you need anything. That notification ensures that we're safe. It also allows each other to know we're thinking about them and the household needs. Mutual agreements, that's a boundary. I'm in a monogamous closed relationship. The mutual agreement is that we're only intimate with each other, we're only providing each other with those sentiments of love, care, and affection because that's a boundary we've placed per a mutual agreement. Last but not least, plans. My wife and I, we call it running a play. So the same way in a sports event or um, league or, or, or team, you call plays. The play is the plan. In football, I use that as a lot, a, a lot in my analogy because I was actually a football player in high school. You have receivers that run routes. The quarterback will determine which one is open and throw the ball based on the routes. So the play is somewhat open-ended with different options. My wife and I, in our relationship, we use boundaries or plays as boundaries because it's, okay, the weekend's coming up. What do you have on your schedule? What would you like to do? Okay, I love riding my bike on the greenways. She loves going to get her nails done, quality time with her girlfriends, whether it be going out to get um, you know, something to eat or a glass of wine. I enjoy going out with my friends and going to watch sporting events. So we put the play together. We'll say from this time to this time, you'll go get your nails done. I'll have the kids. When you come back, I'll go ride my bike. Then at the end of the evening, we'll engage with the family and watch a movie. Ready? Break. That's today's play. Those boundaries allow that we both are secure and we understand what the plan is. So now I'm going to segue into the four different common people, places, things, and behaviors that can breach those boundaries that you have to protect your relationship from. All of these four things are good, by the way. So I'm not saying these are negative things or people. They're great. They're major foundational moments, people, excuse me, they're foundational pieces in your life, but if not managed, they can cause harm instead of good. So the first one, your family, okay? Your family has to be regulated because when you decide to get married or establish an intimate relationship, that you're committed to, you're now creating another family. I tell couples all the time, when you get married and if you don't have any kids or anything, you're a family of two. You and that partner are the two most important people in that family unit. Your opinions, your feelings matter more than anybody else. That's the union of marriage. So where family comes into play is the family has to learn or be readjusted and understanding that concept. So the boundaries would look like 
making sure you're not sharing information with family that needs just to be between you guys. There's certain things that need to just stay between you and your partner. Think of it like a book. There's certain parts of that book that don't need to be re read out loud. There's certain pages that are only authored by you two. So things including your sex life, arguments and disagreements, times when you're not on the right page, those don't need to be brought to family members. The reason why is because once you heal, once you work through the issue, you go into the family environment and now they feel like they have permission to talk about that piece of your life. It makes your partner uncomfortable. And then if you guys have already healed, they're seeing your partner in a negative light because you shared to your family at that time what was going on. Families have alliances with their members. My mother and father have an alliance with me. My wife's family has an alliance with her. When we get married, when we got married, that alliance doesn't go away, but we've created a new alliance with each other. And that has to come first. Boundary intruder number two, your friends. Friends are a major part of your life. Friends provide support. Friends provide comfort. Friends are staple members of your community. However, friends don't need to be invited into your relationship. Same way with family. When friends feel like they have an invitation to share their opinion, then they're in a position of attempting to control the decisions and outcomes. That's not their responsibility. So the way you protect your relationships when it involves friends looks like making sure that if you have a friend that you talk to about your relationship or you confide in, that friend isn't your partner's friend too. I have a good friend, um, we call him Mr. S. He's a great friend that I confide in when I'm having issues in my marriage and I trust his opinion. He knows my end game. My end game is to be committed and faithful to my wife. So his dialogue or the dialogues we have or the feedback aligns with my end game of reconciling the situation. So I trust confiding in him because he knows the purpose of me talking is to vent or to let feelings out. And then he gives me a perspective or an opinion that isn't biased toward just how I feel. He actually asks questions that open up the dialogue and allow me to think about my wife's thoughts and feelings. So I trust that friend because he knows the objective, he's non-biased, and he asks questions more than he provides feedback. That's not my wife's friend. Why is that important? Because my wife doesn't have to worry about engaging with him and then being judged based on a dialogue we had. My wife has a close friend she used to work with. That's her friend. I'm not calling her friend. I'm not confiding in her friend. That relationship is separate. So when my wife and I have mutual friends, we don't talk to our relationship. We don't talk about our relationship to those mutual friends. So I want to put that disclaimer so you know it's okay to have those friends that you talk to, but make sure that friend understands your objective. If your objective is to stay with your partner and go through the growing pains, that friend needs to understand that. That way they're not attempting to lead you away from your objective. They're not judging you or criticizing you. So know what the friends are good at and what they're not good at. And that's, that's going to be critical of managing the boundaries. The third boundary intruder, your employment, occupation, or business. We need money in our society in order to function. We need money and assets and resources to acquire goods, services, take care of our families and ourselves. However, when the need to obtain money or employment becomes greater than what it's designed to support, that now is a problem. I work with a lot of high caliber individuals, CEOs, vice presidents, professional athletes, and these individuals wrap a lot of their identity in their job, which is great. That's awesome. That's a calling. That's something you're passionate about. 
The issue comes when you don't know how to cut it off. The boundary looks like, hey, when I'm at work, I'm at work. When I'm with my family, I'm with my family. So employment, occupation, business has to be something you manage where it doesn't take over the relationships that you say that are the most important to you. And I had a, a female client. She came in with her husband. She was a vice president. In, in Charlotte, where I'm located, there are a lot of banks. The banking industry is really big here. And these individuals are extremely successful. So when she goes to work, She's a female, she has the pressures, she's also a minority female. So she has these internal pressures to make sure that she's representing herself in a professional light. And she has the pressures of being the first in her family to graduate college. So she doesn't wanna let herself down or her legacy down. However, companies are designed to generate profit. They're designed to get their needs met. They're not designed to set the boundary so you can spend time with your family. If you have accessibility on the weekends or on the vacation, they're going to call you. So when you seek out employment, have that conversation with the employer. Have that conversation with clients if you're, not, if you're an entrepreneur. Let your clients know, hey, I desire to provide good care and quality service, but at this time, if I don't recharge... I don't have anything that's going to replenish me, so I can't provide good quality care and service. So that's not the company's or the business responsibility. That's your responsibility. Last but not least, leisure activities. Once again, that's an important piece of your life. You need to have time to get away, enjoy activities that recharge you. When those activities become more important than your family, that's a problem. My father and my mother, they're, they're now divorced and growing up, their relationship was conflictual at times and they stayed together predominantly just because they had three kids. And I remember my dad would spend the whole weekend on the golf course. He would spend the whole weekend at the pool hall or the gun range and I would be with him. He was a great dad. He would have his kids with him doing these activities. But... As I got older, I realized some of that was because he didn't want to be with my mother. And the leisure activities didn't have a boundary because that was his escape. But it left my mom feeling rejected, hurt. And that's why leisure activities are important to manage. And they can be a substitute or... They can drown out problems or issues. Work can do the same. A lot of couples drown themselves in work because they don't want to be with their partner. And men, we tend to have this fake persona that as long as we're making money, everything else is okay. And in one of my prior videos, I talk about providing is beyond just money. So having the boundaries on family, friendships, employment, and leisure activities are critical. And if these boundaries don't exist, it's time to ask yourself why. In the story of my father and other relationships, they didn't want the boundary. They wanted the escape. They wanted to drown themselves in work. They wanted to drown themselves in leisure activities. Sometimes it's this pool where the loyalty with family is tough to reevaluate or to redetermine because prior to getting married or prior to having that commitment, you were committed to your partner. And, excuse me, you were committed to your family. So now you're in a position where you're having to teach your family new rules. Call different plays. So managing boundaries is an ongoing process. And now I'm going to segue into five different steps or areas that can help you manage this ongoing process. First one, designate protected times to engage with your partner. Be intentional. When you have life speed up with work, kids, activities, being with your partner and scheduling uninterrupted time is your responsibility at that point. It won't just happen. You have to adjust your time as life changes. That looks like 
anticipating moments and planning them where your partner and you can be together, whether it be a simple lunch or breakfast meeting. Yesterday, for a matter of fact, um, I, I was on the way to the office and I had a client cancel and I had a gap of two hours before the next appointment. And it was around 10 a.m. The first thought was, great, I don't have a client till 12. I can get a, a, a nice little breakfast brunch. Let me see what my wife's doing. I call her, hey, um, I'm at the diner down the street. Um, do you have about an hour to come meet me for lunch or, break, or, or brunch? Yeah, no problem. So that's impromptu, but if I didn't meet her yesterday, which was Thursday, I know on a Friday today that when I'm done with these videos, we're gonna go get our fried fish sandwich. So we have rituals and routines that designate specific periods of time where we're gonna engage. That's a boundary. No one breaches that time that we have. Step two, practice not sharing details pertaining to your intimate relationship. That's critical. When you share information with someone, it's almost an unsaid invitation. You're inviting them in to provide input and feedback. You're inviting them in to now have an opinion. The problem is when you invite someone in, they sometimes don't know when not to come in. So they're gonna be invited in that dialogue constantly. So be careful not giving everybody access to your relationship. That's really important with managing boundaries. Make sure that your job doesn't have that access. People don't need to know about your personal business. Keep your personal business personal. Make sure that you see your business, your life, your family as value in terms of, if I'm gonna share this information about my life, I've had to vet that person out. I have to, to understand that I'm giving them something of value when I share with them my life experiences. Step three, learn to say no by turning down invites and requests. I use the analogy of companies merging. When you marry or engage in a committed relationship, it's like two companies merging. Mergers usually look like firing and rehiring. So when you and your partner come together, there needs to be a fire and a rehire. You let go of all the people, places, and things and say, okay, what are we gonna now rehire? How are we gonna engage these behaviors, people, places, and things collectively? I'll never forget, um, I had a really close high school friend. It was a female. I never was intimate with this person. I always was very cordial. We, we respected boundaries. Even when we, we went out for coffee or lunch, we split the bill 50-50. We made it known to each other that this was a real friendship, nothing intimate. When I got married, my friend came over to the house. I think uh, we we had um, just celebrated my son's birthday. She wanted to stop by and drop a toy truck off for my son. And um, I told my wife, I was like, hey, such and such came over, dropped the truck off for, for our kid. And my wife and I, we were earlier on in the marriage and my wife communicated to me, hey, I, I know you're not cheating. I know you're committed, but in this stage of our marriage, I don't have the security right now for you to continue to have female friendships. In that moment, I had to make a choice. What was more important, my wife's security or a cordial friendship that didn't have as much value as my marriage now has. I called my friend and I said, hey, look, um, my wife really doesn't feel comfortable with me engaging with single females. I know we have history, you know, but I, I'm, I'm new to this marriage thing and I don't wanna have any issues at the beginning of the process. And she was upset. She was like, what? You're letting this woman control your life? Oh my gosh, you know, we never have done anything like that. I don't even see you like that. I, you know, we're cool. I said, I get it. But I made the choice to be with my wife. And if that's something she needs at this stage of the marriage, I got I got I got obliged to that. I'm choosing to accept and embrace that. She's not controlling me. I'm choosing to give her what she needs to feel secure because I don't want headaches and issues later. Now, fast forward 15 years now down the line. I have professional colleagues that are female counselors that I communicate with. We've had 
uh, these individuals over to our home. They've helped celebrate the birth of our children. So now we're in a stage where my wife is comfortable with that. So that was something which was important, learning how to fire and rehire people and understanding that your partner is going to be changing. So I've had to learn how to turn down invites and requests. And also I had to learn how to insert relationships. Number four, begin your engagements by prefacing your departure time. This is a very important one with family. I remember doing a, a couple of session and, and the guy came in with his wife or, or they were actually engaged. And he said, look, Chris, I'm having an issue. When I go to my dad's house or my mom's house, we can't leave. And, and it's not that we don't want to see him, but at some point we, we have a, an agenda. We want to go to someone else's home. We want to spend time together. Our weekends are short because we work, you know, really aggressive jobs. And, and, and the, the counseling was about setting the boundaries. And one of the techniques or tools they applied that was very helpful was giving the plan up front. So he began going to his dad's house and it was easy to leave because he said, to his dad and all the guests, hey guys, um, it's four o'clock. Uh, my wife and I, my, excuse me, my fiance and I, we're gonna be here to about six because by 6.30, we have a movie to catch. Or by 6.30, we have dinner, dinner reservations. What that does is it aligns the engagement where the people know what's gonna happen. So by 5.50, when they see you get in the coat, and ready to go, it's like, oh yeah, I want you to be late to that movie. Or, hey, I want to make sure you get those reservations. The same goes with phone calls. I had a client, he would say how his mom would call all the time. We gave, you know, him an intervention or, or, or excuse me, when I say we in therapy, the client and I are working together. So I don't tell people what to do. From the process, we found out that his time driving to and from work is a 30 minute commute. So he used his drive time as a boundary to talk with mom. Mom loved it because she got more consistency of engaging with her son and the quality was higher. So the 15, what are you doing calls? I got to call you back, mom. We're now consolidated in a 30 minute drive home every other day. So the boundaries when you are, are good when you preface what's going on. You set the expectation. You tell the partner or, or the person what's going to happen so they don't have to feel disrespected. They've already been informed what's going on. The fifth step, get comfortable not being available to others and be comfortable being available to your partner. Once again, some of this is opinion. So I'm not saying this video is designed as, as, as do what Chris says. The goal of the video is to get you to think about how you and your partner are going to develop your own boundaries. As an example though, however, I'm comfortable turning down invites. When I got married, my wife wasn't as sociable as she is now. So her thought was, hey, Chris, we just got married. Let's focus on getting this thing strong before we try to have all these couple dates and go to every family function. Let, let's try to work on what we got first. So when we present to others, we got our stuff together. Initially, I didn't understand that. I was wanting to do the same things that I did prior to being married. Every family function I'm going to attend. What I learned over time is that we have to look at engagements as a joint decision now. And we don't make every event. We don't make every trip. We don't do every invite. Instead, we process what our needs and wants are. And then we determine if it's going to fit in our schedule. So the number one boundary or the, the fifth boundary, excuse me, is getting comfortable telling people no or give the answer after you and your partner have developed your plan. That is very important when it comes to establishing and sustaining boundaries with outside people so your relationship's not negatively impacted. I hope this video was helpful. We talked about the four different boundary intruders which were family, friends, employment, and leisure activities. We also talked about the five different approaches you and your partner can take to preserve and protect your relationship. One, designate specific protected times to engage with each other. 
Two, practice not sharing details pertaining to your intimate relationship with others. Three, learn to say no by turning down invites and requests. Four, begin your engagements by explaining your departure time. Five, get comfortable not being available to everyone else and being available for your partner. I hope this video was helpful. The goal of this video was to align with a lot of the products and materials we have on our website, Relationship Counseling Tools, which are designed to ensure that partners feel safe, heard, understood, and cared for by each other. My name is Chris Matthews. I'm your relationship coach and licensed marriage and family therapist. I look forward to seeing you on the other side. Oh, you can never go back. I gotta take it on the other side.